plastics are making their way from land to the ocean, um, being carried by water. So this is rainwater, stormwater, snow melt, uh, all over the globe. When we're in classrooms and we're trying to define for, for young people what a watershed is, we like to ask them to imagine a bowl and imagine it raining into that bowl. Each of those water drops is going to uh, slide down the bowl to the lowest point. So the whole planet is covered in watersheds, all of these different bowls, and they're all delineated by high points like mountains and hills, and any water that drops upon them is going to make its way through the ground or the streets or over land um, into the rivers, which then are going to drain into lower and lower bowls until they ultimately reach the ocean. Storm drains are connected and they do work the same way that rivers do in this way. It's estimated that over two million metric tons of plastic are making their way to the ocean via rivers um, and being carried by water. So when they say that 80% of plastics are making their way to the ocean via land, this is how it's happening. It's storm drains and tributaries and rivers that are our connection with our living planet. At ACAP Cape Breton, we have a few different community programs that help us to divert waste from traveling via water to the ocean. Um, we have our Trash Formers group, which is a group of students who we have each summer with the help of the CBRM Solid Waste Department. And this team of students are picking up trash all over the CBRM every single day. We also have a uh, a, an eco shop that we're opening soon, a little store where we sell things that don't have packaging such as shampoo bars, um, things that are biodegradable like bamboo toothbrushes and biodegradable cleaning products which do come in plastic bottles but you can come and refill them at our refill station so you only have to buy that plastic bottle once. We also do a lot of wastewater uh, education with the CBRM wastewater folks and um, this is a really fun part and we get to talk to people about how their habits at home are contributing to ocean waste and we get to do shoreline cleanups. So this year we did four shoreline cleanups with the help of the CBRM wastewater folks and with RBC. We cleaned up Dominion Beach, Florence Beach, um, Indian Beach in North Sydney and Big Glace Bay Beach. So it's really great to be out with our feet in the sand and actually picking up and making a difference. There are lots of different ways that people can help to divert waste and um, one of them is to realize that unless you have a septic tank, everything that's going down your drains is ultimately going to end up in the ocean. So not flushing uh, feminine hygiene products, cigarette butts, dental floss is a really good way to stop these items from ending up in the ocean. Um, we are directly connected so anything that you flush down the drain is basically you might as well just throw it on the beach. Um, another really great thing that, that we can all do is think about um, the top offenders for the Trash Formers pickup list this summer. Their number one item that they picked up was plastic bags. They picked up 11,700 plastic bags around the CBRM. Their second offender was coffee cups. So they picked up uh, almost 9,900 coffee cups. If we remember our reusable bags and reusable coffee cups, it's a direct way that we can stop them from ending up on the ground and in the ocean. I'm Dana Mount. I'm an Associate Professor of English and Environmental Studies at Cape Breton University, where I'm also the co-director of the Bachelor of Arts and Science in Environment. Two years ago, uh, myself and two students, Cassidy Harris and Justine Trask, embarked on an exciting project where we um, did a beach cleanup of, we called it 10 beaches in 10 days. So we looked at 10 CBRM beaches, uh, that's Cape Breton Regional Municipality, starting at sort of New Victoria and going all around to Catalone. Um, we identified 10 beaches that were accessible to us. Some were public, some were private, um, some were popular swimming beaches and others were popular walking beaches or beach combing areas. And some were new to me and some were new to the students. So we had a nice mix of things that were all within about a 30 minute drive of Cape Breton University. We wanted to participate in the global movement around studying uh, marine debris and beach garbage. And we wanted to take a sort of first survey at what's, what the beaches in our, our area look like. Um, these aren't the main tourist beaches that people come to Cape Breton for, um, but these are the ones that are sort of uh, near the main 
most populated areas in Cape Breton. So they were going to give us some interesting results, we thought. So our process for this project was to go to the beaches and to uh, pick a section of the beach and usually do about a 30 minute timed survey. Now there were three of us and our parameters were that we would only pick up what we could physically carry and what we could physically put in my small car for the way home. So we were focusing on smaller debris, um, although we identified a lot of really large debris that the students got excited about and we couldn't always take back with us. So on these timed walks, um, we would also try to plug in our findings to something called the Marine Debris Tracker. And this is an app that's used internationally um, where you can take a photograph of the items you find or just log the number of items you find and upload it to their database. So I think we were the first Cape Breton contribution to that. Um, and we experimented on some walks with using the tracker and on other, other walks it just um, seemed like the app was getting in the way of, of the collection or the timed experiment. Uh, so it was quasi-scientific, uh, I would say. Uh, and what we ended up finding was um, we ended up cleaning up and carrying home or back to the lab with us over 1,400 items. Uh, and when we looked at the data from this, the results were really interesting um, and somewhat surprising in terms of results that are often uh, brought, brought home from these types of projects. So we mostly were finding um, plastics, uh, but more in the sense of fishing gear. Um, we found lots of rope, nylon rope. We found parts of traps. We found whole traps. Now we weren't able to carry many whole traps back because of the parameters, the physical parameters of our particular survey. Um, we found dozens and dozens of lobster bands. Uh, so our, we got a real picture of a vital and vibrant uh, fishing industry in the CBRM, which is exciting on one hand. Um, but also um, offers the opportunity for pause uh, because the vibrancy of the industry um, and its vitality in the area in terms of our economy is so important but the amount of debris that we found was also disturbing and is something that um, I hope as a community we can work towards addressing. Um, when I've looked at the um, when I've looked at the data gathered across the country from the Nature Conservancy who does the beach cleanups and they, they pool their data. They list top 10 items found on Canadian beaches and um, that was not consistent with the top 10 items that we found on our um, survey. We were mostly finding, like I said, um, things related to the fishing industry, um, including tags from lobster traps or um, other kind of fishing tags. Uh, and the top item on the top three items on this Nature Conservancy um, survey was straws, bottles, and um, straws, bottles, and cups. And where we did find some of this, certainly on the CBRM beaches, I think what we find there is a picture that uh, a that looks more like a beach involved in labor and industry rather than a beach involved in um, recreation and leisure. Um, so we're an interesting case in Cape Breton, um, maybe nationally, in that any changes that we can make with the fishing and lobster industry could have immediate um, and really positive effects right on our very own beaches. So I think that um, we've got a great argument to make for a test case for trying out some new um, tactics. We caught up with Joel from the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to learn about their work and the steps they are taking to address ghost gear globally. Hi Joel, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Um, what's its overall goal or mission, I guess you could say? Sure. Um, our mission is to ensure safer, cleaner oceans by driving economically viable and sustainable solutions to the problem of ghost fishing gear globally. Um, we aim to do this um, by improving the health of marine ecosystems, protecting marine life from harm, and safeguarding human health and livelihoods. Um, really, it's about bringing um, as many different stakeholders to the table to discuss this problem of lost and abandoned fishing gear as possible and try to have solutions uh, in the most holistic way as possible around the world. Uh, 
Um, ghost gear um, is lost and abandoned fishing gear, uh, also known as abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear, or ALDFG, you'll see it abbreviated sometimes. Uh, it's the most harmful form of marine debris, um, pound for pound, being purposely designed to capture and entangle marine life. Um, it has tremendous impacts on harvestable fish stocks. They say between uh, 5 to 30 percent um, of global harvestable fish stocks uh, are killed by ghost gear every year, um, as well as other forms of marine life such as seals, dolphins, turtles, and coral. Um, fishing gear is generally made of very strong materials, mostly plastics, that can la uh, last in the marine environment for hundreds of years. Uh, and when it's lost, it can continue to catch marine life for the duration of its life cycle. Um, some gear types are more harmful than others, of course, but all of them have an impact on the marine environment when lost. There are some misconceptions, even within the fishing community. Like I said, I, I was in the fishing industry for 20 years and didn't really realize this is a problem. I don't think it's realistic for us to expect the fishing or the, the fishers themselves to understand the global extent of the problem, because when they're forced to cut gear loose, we have to remember that's an economic hardship for a fisher to lose that gear. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're forced because of weather or a snag beneath the surface or whatever it is, um, you, you know, that's an economic loss to them, but they can't be expected to understand what that looks like on a global scale. Um, especially because, again, it's a largely a subsurface problem. So the effects of it aren't really well understood or documented, although that's becoming less so now. Um, but uh, we, we encourage fishers to get in, uh, get involved with the Triple GI, to engage with us. We want to, you know, um, uh, produce or uh, promote some of our best practices that we have. Um, we have a document called the Best Practice Framework for the Management of Fishing Gear, or the BPF we call for short. Um, it's freely available on our website right now, and it tries to address the problem of ghost gear throughout the entire fishing supply chain. So from fishers themselves, to um, uh, fishing companies, processors, regulating authorities, researchers, governments, um, everybody who has a part to play in the fishing supply chain, there's things that they can do to mitigate this problem. And that uh, document is really designed to offer those types of guidance and best practice to, um, to as many different uh, people in that supply chain as we can. Um, for the general public, I mean, Anyone who's interested in learning more, finding solutions uh, to this to this issue, uh, we encourage them to visit our website at www.ghostgear.org um, and explore the learn section in the top right hand corner. I mean, there you can find a series of outreach and guidance documents, um, including the full BPF, um, which uh, you know can really help people get a better understanding of the issue because there's. Honestly, not a great deal that the public at this point can do other than be aware um, and uh, understand the, the causes of the situation. Um, and I think it's really important for the, understand, for the public to understand that fishers don't want to lose their gear. There is no circumstance where a fisher ever wants to have their gear lost, whether it's a storm or gear conflict or whatever it is. Um, it costs them money and it's the means by which they feed two to three billion people on the planet who rely on seafood as their primary source of protein. So. Um, intentional discard is, is really comparatively rare. It occurs mainly in environments and geographies, um, maybe developing nations where there are no viable disposal options. So I think people really need to understand the situation. This is not a case of fishers throwing gear over the side of their vessels. Um, it really is about um, just the circumstances and, and the often challenging and dangerous environments that fishers fish in. Um, so with global food security a major concern over the coming decades, human populations set to hit around 10 billion by 2050, we're going to need to rely on sustainable fishing to help glow, uh, uh, supply this uh, growing population of protein. So I think that people need to be much more aware of the reality of the situation and, and uh, understand that the fishing industry, um, especially through the Triple GI, are trying to implement solutions to this issue uh, on a global level. And um, uh, yeah, we're, we're making steps. We've, We've only been around since uh, I think the Triple GI officially launched in September of 2018, or sorry, of 2015. So it's just been over three years. We've come a long way since then, and um, yeah, we're we're looking forward to uh, continuing to expand our impact um, in the future to address this major critical ocean issue. My name is Alexa Goodman. I'm a master's graduate out of the Marine Affairs Program at Dal. Uh, my research focuses on lost, abandoned, and discarded fishing gear in the Bay of Fundy's lobster fishery. I was working as a fisheries observer two summers ago on George's Bank out of Yarmouth, and I was talking to some fishers about this issue of ghost gear, which I had first heard of. And there seemed it seemed to be a contentious issue, and as I started doing more research, 
into trying to find out how much of this fishing gear exists in Atlantic Canada. Do we know how much gear is lost? I found nothing. I found information that was really dated from the 80s from gillnet fisheries that don't exist anymore. Um, but I had first-hand experience of you know, fishers telling me that they've lost gear, fishers telling me that they know people who dump gear. Um, and it sort of rung an alarm to me because we don't have this information and you could assume that if people are losing lots of gear, then maybe this is a problem. And that sort of just uh, led into this research when I started my master's and here we are. There's a distinction between ghost gear and derelict fishing gear. So when gear becomes lost, abandoned or discarded into the environment, it either will keep fishing indiscriminately on commercially valuable species. So in the case of uh, lobster traps, it could be ground fish and lobsters. And then there's derelict fishing gear, which could be rope or just a piece of a trap that isn't really catching anything, um, but is simply contributing to marine debris. So ghost gear essentially is gear that continues to fish Unattended? Mm -hmm. Unintendedly. Um, so for example, in a trap, there's something called the self-baiting cycle, where even though a trap may not be baited, a fish or a lobster may go in and get trapped, and it, it basically starts to decompose, and it becomes bait as it attracts new scavengers, which then are eating on whatever species is in there. Um, it then becomes in traps, start to decompose, and then it attracts more scavengers and it's just this negative endless cycle of fishing and you won't even know how much is caught because the traps remain on the bottom for we don't even know how long yeah and the traps not only target uh, lobster but other other, other species yeah. as well so. other ground fish as well um, I'm not quite certain what exact species, but you, we can assume cod, flatfish, potentially cusk, and wolffish, which is of concern because wolffish are listed as a species at risk under Sarah and Coswick. Um, so hopefully we can gain some more information on what types of fish, uh, not just lobster, get caught in these ghost traps. So tell us a little bit about your research uh, in the Bay of Fundy, uh, some of their findings and, and, uh, and things like that. So I interviewed 32 fishermen and five members of DFO um, and one thing I heard a lot of is that loss is inevitable. Fishermen lose gear a lot for, especially in the Bay of Fundy, for environmental conditions. Right, The Bay of Fundy has the world's highest tides of 50 feet at the basin's head. It flushes enough water that is equivalent to all the freshwater rivers in the world. It's a really dynamic environment and it also attracts you know, a lot of other industries. You have shipping, you have oil and gas, you have aquaculture, you have um, scallop draggers, you have ground fish, you have lobster. There's a lot of competing uses in this area. Um, and reasons for loss do vary from LFA to LFA depending on what other industries are present and what environmental conditions are present. Um, but for example, in LFA 34 in southwest Nova Scotia, one of their main reasons for loss is from congestion with other lobster fishers. So essentially what happens is if you're not really paying attention when you're setting your gear, you could set on top of one another, and then what happens is your gear gets chafed off or parted. So essentially the person whose gear is on top is at a loss because as the person on the bottom is hauling their gear up, it creates tension in the lines and it's going so fast that it might break apart the trawl on top and then they lose half their gear, or it could create these large snarls. In comparison, in LFA 36, which is southwest New Brunswick, um, they're often losing gear because of uh, other industries. Sometimes aquaculture will tow a pen and not notify lobster fishermen and, and cut their lines, or you know, gear may shift um, after a storm and then you know, a ferry goes by and, and cuts a line and then fishers don't know where it goes. So in your report, uh, you mentioned that uh, dumping of old gear was an issue and you surveyed fishers in multiple LFAs, uh, 34, 35, 36, and 37. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting actually some of the, some of the uh, information you have here. So 38% of the fishers uh, you interviewed stated they, they heard of others doing it. So what's your thoughts on, on this data that you collected as far as at sea dumping goes with, with, with this type of gear? 
Um. Well, first of all, I think that this number is actually, uh, I think that number is wrong. I think it's actually much higher than 38% of fishers. Granted, that's just a small snapshot of the fisher whom I've interviewed, but at the end of the day, you're getting people to admit that they've either done something that's illegal or they know someone who's done or is doing something illegal. Um, so I think that that number is actually much larger, and I think the problem is bigger than what we think. Um, and why is it a problem? Uh, well, effectively, we're pretty much destroying the resource which we are reliant upon. Um, but I think it points to a bigger problem of why isn't there something else that can be done with these old traps? Why, uh, why do we believe that this isn't a problem? Why do we think that this creates habitat? Um, and I just think that this, there needs to be a little bit more awareness and education on this. Um, we also need uh, actual evidence. Um, I'm really excited to be taking on a project where we're using ROV footage to actually um, see what types of debris we come across in the Bay of Fundy and um, maybe can we show that this does or doesn't create habitat. Um, but I also think it, it points to a need for proper solid waste management. Um, Fundy North Fishermen's Association in southwest New Brunswick has come up with a really innovative solution for using old traps. They've started connecting fishers with landscapers um, to build retaining walls. And fishers are more than happy to work with these landscapers because the landscapers are contacting them, they're willing to meet them wherever, and fishers are like, please take these old traps, we don't have anything to do with them. Some fishers will try to sell their old traps, some fishers um, uh, get their traps repurposed for bunny cages, I've heard, which was really interesting. Um, but then the issue is like, what about these old traps that get washed up? What about the rope? There is so much rope that is used that's replaced. Um, most of it gets sent to landfills. And while it has been tossed around, uh, you know, rope can be repurposed for mats and for other products. Well, yes, that is true. It's not a scalable solution, meaning that it's there's so much rope that you can't possibly make enough with all of this rope. Um, so I definitely think that the biggest avenue for improvement, aside from better reporting on losses and retrievals, would be finding solid waste management solutions and educating fishers on the impacts of ghost gear, which would also require a little bit more research and actually collaboration with fishers. And it is undeniable that marine debris and marine plastics are a problem. What most people fail to realize is that 76% of all macro debris, so the bigger stuff that's in the ocean, is fishing gear. And in the Maritimes, the inshore fishery since the collapse of the cod fishery is almost exclusively limited to lobster. Lobster is a billion dollar industry. It contributes to one third of all fishery exports. This is a huge money making industry. And as a corporate driven fishery, not necessarily corporate, I shouldn't say that, but as a fishery that is, that is really economically important, we should be protecting the resource that we want to have continue this wealth for generations to come. And we really don't know much about the impacts of this gear. I mean, it would be a really big shame if we come to realize years down the road that all of these old traps out there may actually be harming stocks um, and that may actually come back to bite us. We just don't know. And I think now that the tides have turned and we've come to know a little bit more about the fishery and how things are run, as especially as technology improves, I think that that's why it's it's on the topic right now. And I, I also do think that um, what has happened with a, a lot of the recent entanglements uh, with the North Atlantic right whale, as well as other whale species, because it's not just the North Atlantic right whale, I think that has also sort of um, posed more questions as to you know, what happens with these fisheries, what happens with lost gear. Um, lost gear has probably always happened, but it's also an issue of capacity. Um, we also have a lot of fishers in this industry, right? In LFA 34 alone, there's almost a thousand license holders. That's a lot of fishers fishing roughly 400 traps per season. I mean, there's a lot of gear out there and we just don't have enough information. I started doing rope weaving about two years ago. Okay. Um, my mom 
when she passed away, she had a bolt of this manila rope left over. And so I wanted to use it. I didn't want mm -hmm. it to go to waste. But um, I always admired her craft. She used to make these. Yeah, those with are With the really manila cool. rope. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I really thought it was cool, but I had never learned from her how to do it. So mm -hmm. anyway, when she passed, I investigated and kept plugging away, trying to figure it out. <laughs> and now I can make one in about 20 minutes. So yeah. it's quite the process. Can you just kind of show us sure. how you... What, so this is this would be a mat. So, yes. so this is, would be a mat that like one over there on the wall. Is like it? that one, yeah. Okay, perfect. This rope is a little bigger. This is three eighths right. polypropylene rope. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so this is called a jig. Okay. Very similar to a loom right. for weaving like wool. Okay. And so when you weave, the crossways um, weave is called the warp. And then when I get up to about here, I take it off the jig and I weave it in and out. That's called the weft. Oh. So, and then I use my hot knives to um, kind of melt the ends together and okay. it secures it. So it's just over, weaving it in and out. Yeah, <laughs> it's very therapeutic. I love it. Yeah. I can, I can get lost in it. So how long would it take for you to make, so from scratch to finished product, doing this process to make that? How long would it usually take you? The weaving doesn't take long, okay. it, about a half hour. Okay. But the process to get to the point of weaving is the, the lengthy one. Like you have to get the rope, you have to, like it doesn't come all neat like this. Yeah. You have to kind of separate yeah. it, take out the knots, if there's tape on it. Right. Um, yeah, Sometimes it's really dirty, so you have to give it a, a little pressure wash before you take it in your in your house. Um, but then the weaving is is the fun part. That's the, the part that's not too bad. So how much rope? So I know you do purchase some rope, but how much rope do you get from fishermen or from sh collecting on shorelines yourself? Um, and um, yeah, you said it's, it can be pretty hard to take it all apart. So, so what's the process, I guess? How much rope do you get? How much do you kind of recycle or reuse? I've used, I've used thousands of feet of rope, mm -hmm. of used rope last year. I, um, I went really gung-ho with the used rope mats. Mm -hmm. The bulk of my rope comes from local lobster fishermen. Okay. Um, this, or, well, last summer, it really, I got the word out that I was collecting this rope and they, they've they been really helpful. And then people like you who collect <laughs> it from the shores, um, that, you know, I, I put that to use too. Some of the bigger rope, <clears throat> like... Uh, so yeah, so I was looking at this rope, so this looks familiar to me. Yes. This looks like the rope that I untangled. It took me yes. probably, <laughs> I think it took me about six days in e about an hour each evening. Oh my gosh, yeah, I can so imagine is, how much work that was. So this is a mat. That is that an ocean you, plate mat. That you turned like, into, from all that rope I collected. Yes. I think it was around almost 200 pounds of rope. Yeah. Or so. Yeah. It was wet at the time when I took the measurement, uh, the weight, but but that's a beautiful mat. Like. Yeah, that's called an so, ocean plate mat and it's done freehand. There's about 90 feet of rope in that mat. And uh, unfortunately, in, in the winter, huh? I can't wow. wash them with my pressure washer. I don't have my setup, but uh, because we collect rainwater and we even recycle the water. Oh, there you go. <laughs> from the gutter, yeah. And this one too. Uh, this is also that, another one. That's another one. These are yeah. well. These are two rope. This so the rope I collected, I found was a kind of a mixture of two different ropes, or maybe even three. And this is one of them too. And yes, are, there was a. a these things would probably sizes. last forever. They'll outlive I mean, us, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah like it's made of really sturdy stuff. And to think that you're purchasing something that you know was once on a shoreline, and, and this rope's probably been through a lot of, a lot of stuff. It's got a history. Yeah. <laughs> if that, that rope could history. talk. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. So that rope is, I'm guessing maybe five eighths, mm -hmm. and the rope in this mat. And I like the way it's kind of, it's smaller. It's like five sixteenths maybe. And um, the, 
adding the colors together. Like you can really kind of get creative with it yeah. if you put your mind to it and kind of think it through and come up with a plan um, of a pattern. I'm just going with the straight one color just to make it easier to okay. kind of show the process. But you can put like different colors in them if you wanted to. Yeah, sure. You could um, split it up into three different colors. I mean, the sky's the limit. You can use the a solid color through here and then for the weft you can use a, mm -hmm. a different color to to weave it through the bars yeah it's really interesting to see what can be made out of material that was once essentially trash on the shoreline you know exactly uh, like that it. usually gets sent to the landfill anyway but to take it and turn it into something unique like this bowl like this is really cool yeah you know and uh and I really like the red That one. yellow rope behind you. Two years ago, my husband and I salvaged that rope from Kenlock Dump. Okay. And the amount of rope that we got from that, that dump site yeah. could have filled this room. Mm -hmm. um, those mats behind you there are, um, are from that same, same pile. Yeah. We've, we made countless amounts. That's all that's left now. So I, I would say I've probably used up close to 30,000 feet of rope wow. last summer. If, so if I'm a fisher and, and, I'm, and I'm out or a recreational uh, person in a boat, for instance, and I, and I come across derelict gear, um, that's obviously, I can kind of tell it's been in the water for a while or, you know, it's banged up or, uh, is it illegal to, to actually take that gear out of the water and take it back to shore? Uh, it's not only illegal to take it out of the water, it's illegal to actually haul it. So the best thing that those people can do is uh, call Fisheries and Oceans and give them the appropriate data such as uh, the location, which could be longitude and latitude, or it could be a GPS coordinate. And uh, a lot of times the gear has a CFE number that identifies the, the the fisher who owns it, or the vessel, or sometimes there's even a fisherman have a tag on the back end of the buoy, which gives their name, address, and phone number, and the vessel. But report that to us, and then we can report it back to the owner, and they can go out and get it after getting permission from us to do it, because we want to know how much gear they're hauling and where they're taking it to, and what, what day and what time, right? So does does DFO towards say at the end of uh, lobster season or or any other season, uh, for instance, go out uh, in these areas and actually look for derelict gear, and, and do they actually retrieve derelict gear? Um, and when it's reported, does DFO go out and retrieve it, or do they leave it up to the fishers? Yes, at the end of the season, we uh, have patrols on the various fishing areas, and we are looking for uh, derelict gear or gear that might have been sunken and then popped up to the surface. And we do, we retrieve it, and we take it back. And then we identify it through uh, VRN numbers or personal tags on the, on the, on the trap or on the, on the buoy. And we will reach out to those fishermen and let them come and get it. So we talked a little bit about derelict gear in the water. So what happens when uh, the gear comes up, comes up, washes ashore? Who's responsible for that gear when it's now on a public uh, a public beach? Well, the fisherman owns the gear is responsible for his own gear. If the gear is in good shape and it's identifiable, it's really up to the fisherman to retrieve his gear. Uh, if gear comes ashore and it's all broken up and it can't be identified, then it's just like all other washed up junk, litter, and Kevin Squires, I'm uh, president of the MFU Local 6 in Cape Breton. I've been here for a while, I forget the year we started. I'm on Fish at a Big Bredore. Can you uh, just tell us a little bit about your organization and, and the types of things that you're involved in? Um, in terms of environmental cleanup or environmental responsibility? Yeah, like ocean conservation. What does your organization do as far as, you know, uh, combating this issue with marine debris, whether it's on the shoreline or, or, or uh, in the ocean itself? Um, recently, we just came from our, our convention. The, the organization represents around 1,200 people, I guess, in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And there's been a history, and it's varied in terms of, of public pressure or public attention. 
on what we've done over the years um, at the most recent convention, the delegates you know recognize that there's a whole lot of environmental issues, whether it's from whales or or plastic in the ocean, and the considerations around M MSC um, approval, those kinds of things that we need, and 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 a lot of fishermen recognize there's a whole lot of things we should we we know enough that we should be doing stuff ourselves. So we've decided to put more of a focus on environmental responsibility, and with that some of what that includes is going back in the 90s, we had a program called Clean Oceans Committee, and there was a, a film that a lot of people ended up with this lovely little catch word about garbage in the ocean, and the response was, the glib, glib and, and facetious response was, where does it go? Well, it goes away. Remember how things used to be? Where's the trash can, Dad? There's no trash can on a boat, boy. Toss it over. The ocean will take it away. But where's it go? Away. The ocean. Thought it could swallow up all our trash. But where does it go? Fishermen now realize the trash kills marine life. Waste thrown overboard, especially plastic, just doesn't go away. So please, bag your trash and bring it back to shore. Part of the problem with, with ocean debris is that in the whole world treats the ocean like that when you look at it. Um, you know, something goes in the ocean and it goes away. And unfortunately, uh, not, I guess the, the, the industry ends up feeling a little bit targeted because we're the ones who are out on the water. And our gear, it's obvious what fi who fishing gear belongs to, but all the other plastic that ends up there, a lot of people put it there. And that sort of speaks, I think, to a little bit of societal perspective on the ocean has traditionally been a dumping ground for a lot of people. But anyway, but happily, uh, the organization has decided to focus on, on rejuvenating that Clean Oceans Action Committee. Um, we've been part of a thing called the Clean, o or Clean Ocean Action Committee is another committee that's been working on oil um, oil survey uh, stuff primarily in southwest Nova Scotia we've been involved in that and Clean Nova Scotia which I think or Clean Nova Scotia Foundation I'm not sure of their name mm -hmm. they've been working for a number of years on um, waste reduction around the ocean so we've been involved in that stuff so the organization has taken a few of initiatives um, we could and can and will be doing more I think to look at programs and what we can be doing that's great uh, we spoke a little bit uh, before about barriers fishers face uh, when they're trying to retrieve some of their their lost gear and uh, and also you know other gear that that is not really unidentified that can't really be identified. What are those barriers that fishers face when it comes to retrieving derelict gear in the water, but also cleaning it up off the shorelines? Mm. They vary. There's a whole bunch of them, and and happily we had a discussion with a, a group of people just recently. And it was really good to get the discussion going and people start saying, well, okay, yeah, you know, we want to clean it up, but here's the problems. The, the first one that comes to mind is that it's, it's often hard to identify who it belongs to. And I'm happy to go clean my own stuff up or three or four people's stuff, but you get a, a mob of traps of 100 traps and they might belong to somebody from 20 miles away. And so uh, who owns it? Who owns the problem? So the, the nature of the problem, and that's the nature of the ocean, it's, it's hard to say who owns whatever's there sometimes. Um, so that's one of, one of the issues and one of the barriers. There's the physical thing that you, you mentioned and we, we talked about, just the cliffs and the geography and that kind of stuff. But as well as that, there are certain areas that are closed off either because they're privately owned or they happen to be provincially or federally protected at, at beach areas that we don't, simply don't have access to. So if we want to get, I'm not sure what the arrangements or the, the permitting process would be for people to get access to the, the beach areas where, where derelict gear is. Um, and then some of the, whether it's perception or reality, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, that DFO does have a very clear and easy way of allowing us to bring gear that we find after the season to bring it ashore. But not everybody knows about that. and. And not everybody's used to used to it, and some people are fearful of being caught by DFO. So, if you see something in the water or after the season, you might hesitate to, to bring it ashore. And one of the, our fishermen had mentioned, well, you know, for example, he can't go out to Scattery Island and just bring gear if he happens to see a trap there. He can't bring it in because he's afraid DFO will report him. And so, well, I guess that's incumbent on us is to make people aware that all they got to do is call DFO and let them know they're bringing this gear ashore and, and they'll be covered.
We call them on the set yeah. and we tell them, look, you've got gear out here off Mackenzie Shoal or you've got gear wherever. Well, last year we had the north through the first two days of the season. And um, right at the north head, the tide takes the traps and takes them over towards Manado and the gully up towards Middle Bank. And I lost three there and I'd go looking for mine. I'd find somebody else. Every day I'd come back, I had four or five on the washboard, bringing them back. Find another people's. And I said, and I was missing one at the end, and I said, well, if there's karma, I'm going to get that back. <laughs> Two days before the season, I ended up, Aaron Wilcox brought it over. It was on Middle Bank. <laughs> and then the yeah. lots to lose their gear. Yeah. Um, but how can we help yeah. the problem, right? How yeah, can we, yeah. what can we do as a society and to kind of to help with this with these issues because it's, it is an issue unfortunately and uh, well, the other one too is it you know like our history is our history you know mm -hmm. we come from a place and like I said it's a little hard to the great example that, that I've had people mention to me is the, the flushing of the Montreal sewer system was it last year well you hear something like that happen realistically I suppose in the greater scheme of things it wasn't that big a problem mm -hmm. realistically I think I'm not I'm not much of a chemist on dilution but it strikes me it wasn't, but it sounds really bad. Mm -hmm. And when a huge city is flushing thousands of liters of crap into the water, it's hard to persuade fishermen that if he loses a glove or loses a buoy, that he's doing the day. You know, it's, it's hard. It it's there's hard, public yeah. perception. So the more publicity we get, mm -hmm. the easier it's going to be for me to say to my buddy who says he's going to throw gloves overboard, Ah, geez, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, you know? Well, it's the same. Because it's hard to do it. I don't want to puck in the face, mm -hmm. you know, particularly. But It's just about changing the way some people attitudes. think, too, right? Attitudes. Yeah. And it's the same with cigarette butts when someone throws a cigarette butt. You know, they don't realize it's litter. But it's it's a big, like, cigarette butts are a huge issue. Like, it's actually disgusting. But people with so second nature to throw it, they don't see it as a problem. I mean, so, yeah, it's changing attitudes is, is a big thing. And, and even when I started this project, people would ask me, you know, there's with so many issues going on with the oceans, why are you choosing something like this? Well, it's just the reason why I chose this was because I spent the entire summer last year cleaning up shorelines. And when you're taking 60 or 70 traps off a shoreline, I mean, you know you have a problem. How much traps does a fisher lose each season? It's quite variable up and down the coast, and every year is different. But just from my own, the most ever lost was 125 on a big storm many years ago and on an average year a half a dozen to ten just either got got washed up in the beach or got hooked by a bloat and the rope cut off but then you might get a big storm like last year and guys might lose a hundred so it varies it's very it varies yeah so what are some steps that fishers take i guess to try to kind of mitigate the loss of gear i mean if if fishers know that there's a big storm brewing do they sometimes go out and take their gear in to kind of to try to help that? Some help that? ports do that. For the most, though, I know where I fish, we just move them out in deeper water. Mm -hmm. We watch the weather, and you, nobody wants to lose gear. As soon as that trap's on the shore, it's not fishing. That's money right out of your pocket. And it's a lot, it would probably be a lot of work to go out to this area and haul all those traps and bring them back ashore. I would uh, yeah, it is, but there is some ports do that. And the reason they do that is because where they fish, it's really shoal water, okay. and they keep short lines on. And they can't take it to deep water without putting longer ropes on. So they bring them in. It's easier to put them on the boat and bring them in. But what we, where we fish anyway, we can move them off far enough in deep water that they don't come ashore for the you know, most part. So when they're in deep water, they're a little bit more protected. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you watch the weather, you know which way the sea is coming from. And you make an effort. Like I said, nobody wants to lose traps. Right. I mean, some, some have speculated that illegal dumping of gear happens at sea. Uh, this is... Uh, information that we receive from the Bay of Fundy area. Um, we don't believe that that's an issue here. I mean, there's no, DFO has suggested there's no evidence uh, to suggest that, but do you, have you ever heard of that type of stuff happening here in Cape No. Britain? You mean like dumping old gear? Or? Yeah, some have, some uh, uh, people have speculated that be due to the, there's nowhere to take old gear, sometimes uh, fishers will take the old gear and dump it at sea. Mm, I've never seen that. I, I shouldn't say that. I, I can go back 30 years. And if you had a couple old wooden traps that you knew you weren't going to fish again, you might beat the ballast out of them, take the ballast, and then throw the wooden trap over, which would probably end up on the beach and just rot there, you know. So we spoke to a fisherman, uh, and he said that the wharfs actually have, like, a, a bin specifically for, for waste materials. Is That's right. Yeah. Most of the harbors have dumpsters. We even have one at our own wharf, uh, and there's only three of us fish there. 
So these dumpsters at the wharves, they that's they're there specifically for for beer and, and stuff and waste that comes off of the the, fish, the vessels. Yeah, like uh, garbage, uh, bait boxes, plastic. Uh, there wouldn't be a lot of room in it for old traps, though. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And a lot of old traps get sold too. Yes. Like new, new from, like in Prince Edward Island, the guys will go over there and buy their old traps, bring them here and fish them, and Newfoundlanders will come up here and buy old wire traps. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, we, from my understanding, there was a major shift from wire to wooden traps in Cape Breton in the late 90s. Is that true? Is, yeah, there is was. Cape it, 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 it used to be all wood, and then okay. it went to wire, and now is a little shift back to more wood. Yeah, and it's it's mixed. It, it varies. Yeah. So what's what's the difference between a wooden trap and a wire trap, as far as you know? A wire trap lasts longer and they're lighter and easier on the back, but I can make more money with a wooden trap, and you'd have to ask the lobster that question. Okay, so the lobsters like the wooden more? Where I fish. Okay. That's what I see, because I would sooner have wire, because they're lighter, they last longer, less repairs, they hold the bottom better in a storm, but okay. that's a question you'd have to ask the lobster. <laughs> Sounds good. Since interviewing the Cape Breton Fish Harvesters Association, they have been busy removing ghost gear from the ocean in LFA 27. traveled to Shetty Camp, Nova Scotia to catch up with Paul Strom to learn about the David Suzuki Foundation and some cleanup initiatives along the musical coast. My name is Paul Strom and I'm an ambassador with the David Suzuki Foundation and I'm also the elected Atlantic Regional Representative for the Council of Canadians. The David Suzuki Foundation is an, an organization that was obviously started by David Suzuki and is focused on social and environmental uh, issues across Canada and the whole organization is, is focused on trying to make uh, society and the planet a better place for all of us to live. One of the things that uh, tourists and local people have in common are all over uh, what we call the musical coast, uh, Inverness County, is the the variety of beaches that, that we have from top to bottom. They're some of the, the most beautiful beaches, I think, that are in Canada. One of the things that we notice, though, is that the, depending on the day, uh, we have a, a huge collection of debris uh, on our beach. And as with any marine environment, you know, a storm will come up and wash it all away uh, one day, but then two days later it'll all be back. So it, it is a, a significant issue, I think, um, because it, uh, it influences uh, so many things. We can, by the debris, we can tell um, what we're doing with our oceans. Uh, whether or not it's the plastics, uh, the, the rope, uh, whatever it is. And uh, we've had a, a couple of uh, cleanups at, on a number, you know, on a couple of beaches. One that uh, we did last year that was a significant cleanup, and it took uh, probably about 15 people, a total of about 10 days, uh, where we came together and uh, this one particular fellow, Roman uh, Buckhofer, organized a group of volunteers and uh, we cleaned up a, a beach called Old Cannery Beach here in Shetty Camp. And there was a huge amount of all sorts of different things, as you can imagine, on that beach. And so it was a, a, 
a real hodgepodge collection of plastics, rope, uh, wood, um, you know, all, all sorts of undescribables. Uh, so uh, we collected, you know, as much of, of the debris as we could. Uh, you know, we picked up all sorts of uh, metal, you know, nails and all, wood. Uh, I mean, that was probably the, you know, it's a significant part of the cleanup. But one of the things was the plastics. Uh, the And plastics and rope are from the fossil fuel industry. And so they're really prevalent. And so as part of this cleanup, the the manager of the Shetty Camp Fishery uh, arranged for a, a semi-trailer truck to, to come in and we loaded up all of the, the plastic, hard plastic containers from that are used in the fishing industry or the processing industry. And uh, we filled, or they filled, uh, you know, a, a 53 foot uh, trailer and then took them down to B-Way uh, Recyclers down in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. So that, that uh, you know, was a significant amount of plastic. And there's still, you know, a lot that's still there. Uh, in different formats, but it's still hard plastic. You know, some of those four foot by four foot containers, you know, used for the fishing industry. So th this is only one beach, though, out of I don't know how many, uh, ranging, you know, from Meat Cove up at the north tip all the way down to Port Oxbury in the south. And all of these beaches are tourist attractions. And my way of looking at a tourist attraction is that when you arrive there, it's the cleaner it is, uh, you know, the more attractive it is. Um, but every single one of these beaches uh, along this coast has all sorts of debris, and it comes from everywhere. Uh, because we're, you know, part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, you know, it it accumulates everywhere. It's astounding, actually, to to see how much there is. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went out, uh, and just within about a 20 to 25 minute period, and within less than 50 feet in terms of a circumference, I picked up an entire bag, a garbage bag full of plastics, uh, mainly plastics and rope. So if you look at uh, that and put it into comparison with the, an entire beach, how many bags of garbage are just on that one single beach? And I know that we've seen pictures of Dylan and his volunteers with uh, Cape Breton Environmental uh, that have cleaned up more than one beach. And you can see by those photos where you've got so many garbage bags full of mainly plastics or rope but they're related to the, you know, the, the oceans. So it, it, you know, when we think about all, all of this, we're only seeing part of what is washed up. <laughs> you know, there's, th that's only one small amount. So if we can look at that in the bigger sense, th there, there's a huge amount m uh, more that's out in the, in the oceans that we're not seeing. In 2019, Cape Breton Environmental Association, in partnership with the New Victoria Volunteer Fire Department and the CBRM Solid Waste Department, removed 140 lobster traps from a two-kilometer stretch of shoreline in Victoria Mines, Nova Scotia. We returned to the same shoreline in 2020 and removed an additional 42 lobster traps. We have also completed several shoreline cleanups in New Victoria in partnership with the Maritime Fishermen's Union, removing upwards of 100 lobster traps and hundreds of pounds of fishing rope. Shorelines in New Victoria and Victoria mines are heavily impacted by abandoned loss and discarded fishing gear. We have removed gear that was over 10 years old. This goes to show just how long fishing gear can last in the marine environment. Just out here in Victoria Mine shoreline, we uh, did a clean up today. We're coming down to the end of it now. Uh, as you can see here, we have around probably around 100 uh, traps and around 20 uh, bags of garbage right now. This is probably one of the biggest cleanups we ever had to date. Um, 
what we're trying to do today is record uh, how many traps come off the shoreline, the tag numbers, so we could uh, keep track of this stuff uh, on an annual basis to see how much gear we're taking off. You say, yes, we do have a problem here, and this is and this is the problem. When you come to a shoreline and you and you, uh, you collect this amount of trash, you know, in, in lobster gear, it's it's really disheartening. Uh, I mean, we're up to about at least 100, 100 sets of traps here, and uh, 20 some bags of garbage. So, and also we have lots of rope too. Uh, rope is another thing we come across quite a lot. Oh, and uh, obviously it's 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 pretty hard to untangle this stuff, but uh, we do the best we do the best we can to uh, to reuse some of this rope and uh, yeah. Since completing tides of change, environmental organizations, community groups, fish harvesters, and everyday people have stepped up to help turn the tide on the marine debris issue. We are proud to have developed partnerships with the Maritime Fishermen's Union, ACAP Cape Breton, Price is Right Moving and Trucking, New Victoria Volunteer Fire Department, and the CBRM Solid Waste Department. Our work would not be possible without support from the volunteer community throughout Cape Breton. Everything we do as an organization is spearheaded by a group of dedicated and passionate volunteers. Abandoned loss and discarded fishing gear or ghost gear is a leading cause of marine debris around the world and has damaging impacts on global fish stocks and marine mammals. Through the Global Ghost Gear Program, the Government of Canada is working with partners to rid our oceans of ghost gear and create new solutions to reduce fishing debris. The Ghost Gear Program was launched in 2019 and included the eight Point three million ghost gear fund. An additional ten million in funding for the program was announced for 2021 and 2022. Since the launch of the program, partners who have received funding through the Ghost Gear Fund have been able to recover approximately 5,828 units of lost gear. Approximately 84% were traps or pots that are commonly used in lobster and crab fisheries, and the remaining 16% was a combination of nets and long lines from various fisheries. Whether you are an environmental organization, fish harvester, or an everyday person, we all have a role to play in keeping our oceans and shorelines clean.